All right, so now that we've uh, talked about the brain, uh, we've broken down the nervous system into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, uh, and then we broke down that peripheral nervous system uh, even further. We're now going to dig into things that go around, uh, go along um, at the uh, at the cellular level is what we're going to talk, take a look at next, um, and we're going to start taking a look at nervous tissue. Uh, now, I kind of envision this like the the neuron is kind of like the superstar cell. Uh, of nervous tissue and like every superstar if we can think kind of think of it as like a, a professional football player um, or like a superstar basketball player or something like that or somebody that's really famous um, they kind of have like a support network of people around them um, that kind of help them out well a neuron is no different and it has a, uh, a support network uh, of cells that hang around with it that kind of help it out uh, on a day-to-day -day basis we call this support network of cells um, we call them neuroglial cells. Um, and then we eventually simplify this rather than say neuroglial. Um, some people just call them glial cells uh, is what you will hear. And these glial cells are going to perform the function to support. Um, they insulate uh, and they're going to protect the neuron is what they're going to do. So they have a variety of functions they're going to perform um, in this neural tissue uh, to, help the, uh, to help the neuron out. Uh, so the first... Uh, neuroglial cell that we have is called an astrocyte. Um, they call them astrocytes. They're also called astroglial cells um, because they kind of have a star shape um, is what they have. And about 20 to 40 percent of your glial cells are these astrocytes. Uh, so they're the most abundant uh, glial cell that we find. Um, what this cell type is going to do um, is it's going to kind of uh, form a barrier between the capillary and the neuron. Uh, itself and it's going to kind of control the chemical environment of the neuron uh, is what it's going to do. So it's going to monitor that chemical environment of the neuron uh, controlling the metabolism of the neuron itself is kind of what's going on uh, with providing it with the uh, nutritive uh, properties and things like that. It's also going to brace the neuron, um, kind of holds it in place is what it's going to do as well. So we can see a picture here of an astrocyte uh, that's right here. And you can see, uh, here's your capillary that's up here. I'll label it with the C. And you can see these are uh, its appendages that it has coming off of it uh, that are right here. And these appendages that are coming off of it are going to be able to tap into this capillary and then deliver these nutrients to the neuron itself. Um, lactate's one of the things that this, uh, this astrocyte um, is going to deliver to the, uh, to the neuron. But you can see it's kind of holding it in place as well. Um, this is your neuron that's back here. So this is your neuron. This is the nucleus of that neuron uh, that's hanging out back there. So it also kind of acts like a support for the neuron as well. Um, if you kind of simplify this into simple terms, what the astrocyte acts like, uh, I would just kind of say that an astrocyte kind of acts like a chef uh, for, the, uh, for the neuron and providing it with, uh, with nutrition. And then it also kind of acts like a support structure, kind of holding it in place as well, um, bracing it to protect it in that particular manner. The next neuroglial cell that we have is a microglial cell. Uh, microglial cells act like macrophages uh, in the central nervous system. Um, they're going to remove neurons that are dead, uh, clean up debris uh, and things like that inside of the brain. Um, kind of act like a bodyguard. Um, if there is a foreign invader, uh, it will take it out through phagocytosis. Uh, so it kind of acts like you can kind of think of it as a janitor uh, slash bodyguard is how I would describe a microglial cell. This is the artist rendition of a microglial cell uh, that they have. The next cell that we have is called an ependymal cell. Um, an ependymal cell is going to be found in open spaces within the brain, in the ventricles, and then in the open spaces within the, uh, within the spinal cord. And these ependymal cells, uh, their primary responsibility is dealing with cerebral spinal fluid. They can produce small quantities of cerebral spinal fluid, um, but these small quantities that they produce aren't as much nearly as they've formed in the uh, and the choroid plexus and things like that. But they do produce a small quantity uh, of cerebral spinal fluid, and then they help move this cerebral spinal fluid uh, around as well. Um, they can absorb some cerebral spinal fluid. Um, they monitor the cerebral spinal fluid. But the ependymal cells, um, they're dealing with the cerebral spinal fluid. They're found in the uh, lining the open spaces, the ventricles uh, of the brain, is where we find this type of neuroglial cell. And this is what these cells look like. This is a cartoon rendition uh, of the ependymal cells. The next neuroglial cell that we have is an oligodendrocyte. 
and the oligodendrocytes, what they're going to do is um, they're only found in the central nervous system. All these neuroglial cells that I just talked about are only found in the central nervous system, and their major uh, function is going to be dealing with myelin. Uh, they're going to produce the myelin that's going to surround the axons uh, in the central nervous system. Now, the peripheral nervous system has something called a Schwann cell, um, and individual Schwann cells wrap around the axon, um, whereas one oligodendrocyte in the central nervous system can wrap around upwards of 50 axons uh, of different neurons that you have. So um, oligodendrocytes are found in the central nervous system. They're producing this myelin sheath that's wrapping around the axon. Uh, this insulation uh, is going to allow this nerve impulse to travel in that uh, uh, one direction. Um, it allows, also allows, increases the speed of transmission by having this, uh, this myelin sheath that's going to, uh, that's going to surround the axon. Um, so one of the big things that you get into is like uh, questions that are asked on a test a lot of times is um, oligodendrocytes versus Schwann cells and things like that. Remember, oligodendrocytes are in the central nervous system, and then the Schwann cells are going to be found in the, uh, in the peripheral nervous system. And this is an artist's rendition uh, picture of an oligodendrocyte uh, that you have. Here's the cell, and you can see this cell type is producing myelin from multiple axons. Uh, like I told you, like one oligodendrocyte can produce enough myelin um, to wrap around upwards of 50 axons. So they're highly efficient. Um, now we're going to move into the peripheral nervous system, and the peripheral nervous system has its own unique neuroglial cells um, that are found in it. Um, we have satellite cells, and we have Schwann cells. Uh, the satellite cells are going to kind of act like an astrocyte to a degree. Um, you can see these cells up here, um, but they kind of wrap around the, uh, the cell body. Um, they're going to provide nourishment uh, to the neuron itself. Uh, and then they also have a protective property that's associated with them as well. Uh, and then you can see we also have the Schwann cells that are here. Now these are each individual cells that are here that are wrapping around the axon and they're producing that myelin for the cells of the peripheral nervous system. We have to remember uh, in the peripheral nervous system, you're no longer protected by bone. So protecting the cell body is vitally uh, important thing to do. Now we move on to the, uh, the superstar of neural tissue, uh, which is the neuron. Uh, and the neuron consists of some major regions that we have. Um, we have the cell body, and then we have processes that extend uh, coming off of the cell body uh, that we're going to take a look at. So this is a uh, diagram of a neuron. This could be a motor neuron uh, that we're looking at here. Um, but you can see this is the cell body that's up here. Okay, so this is the cell body. And then these extensions that are coming off the cell body, these extensions are what we call processes. We have two types of processes. We have processes that send information to the cell body. So this would be a process sending information to the cell body. And that's what we call a dendrite. So these structures here are all called dendrites. Then we have processes that are sending information away from the cell body. And this is what we call an axon. So these processes are dendrites. And then we have our axons. So I introduced you to those. So we have that firm understanding of a dendrite and an axon. And this isn't what all neurons look like uh, when we took a, take a look at them. Um, this is like the, the diagram they give you a lot of times, but there's sensory neurons look different than this. Um, and we'll take a look at some of the different sensory neurons as well um, and be able to identify their dendrites and their axons. But this cell body is going to be the metabolic hub of the cell um, is what we're going to have. This is where the nucleus ha is at. This is the, where all your chemical reactions are going to occur is in this cell body. Um, inside the cell body we find these structures called missile bodies. Um, this is a modified uh, endoplasmic reticulum that we have uh, inside of a neuron and that's where protein production is going to occur. Um, we also have a cytoskeleton within the, uh, within the cell body um, that's going to act like support beams. Uh, we call them neural uh, fibrils uh, is what we have inside the neuron and you can see the nissel substances are up here um, which is where protein synthesis occurs. Okay. And then we have the, uh, the, the, uh, the neurofibrils are also going to be located in here that act as support beams to help uh, protect, or not to protect, but help keep the, uh, the neurons uh, the neuron shape. So those are two additional things that we find within the, uh, within the cell body. When I take a look at the axons, the axons end in these axon terminals. So basically this electrical impulse is going to travel all the way down the neuron here. And as this electrical impulse reaches the ends of the axon, we call the ends of the axons, these are called axon terminals. 
and it's within these axon terminals that we find neurotransmitters. Once an electrical impulse reaches the end here, that causes these neurotransmitters to be released. And these neurotransmitters then are going to stimulate the next neuron, okay, to produce its electrical signal is what's going to happen. So this is going to stimulate then the next neuron to release its electrical signal. Um, this space, or this whole structure, this right here, is called a synapse. The space in between these two adjacent neurons is called the synaptic cleft. Um, and that's what you're looking at there. So this whole structure here is called a synapse, okay, between axon terminal and axon terminal. I mean, axon terminal and dendrite of the next neuron. And then this space is called the synaptic cleft. Uh, and that is what this slide is explaining right here the differences between the synaptic cleft and the synapse. Um, I'm not going to get too uh, nerdy with you on that, um, but just note that these neurons, they come in close contact with one another, but they really don't touch one another. Um, and in this space is where the neurotransmitters are released right in between here, um, and that's going to stimulate this next neuron then to generate its electrical impulse um, so we can continue this electrical uh, communication. So one additional structure I want to point out is this area right here that joins the cell body. Let me draw this right here. This structure right here that joins the cell body to the axon is called the axon hillock. And the axon hillock is important because it acts uh, kind of like a regulator that determines um, whether this neuron is going to generate an action potential. So all this sodium is going to build up in here um, in, the, uh, in the cell body uh, from the dendrites. And this excess sodium that builds up, if there's enough, uh, propagation of this chemical change, then that's going to generate an action potential that's going to go all the way down the um, axon to the axon terminal. Now, the axon hillock is kind of like the deciding, the deciding point as to whether we're going to generate this electrical impulse um, or we're not going to generate this electrical impulse. Uh, so this is kind of the deciding threshold area right here um, in this axon hillock area as to whether this electrical impulse is going to be generated. We're going to generate an action potential that's going to travel down the uh, down the axon um, and release neurotransmitters, or we're just going to kind of stop, uh, and we're not going to generate this electrical impulse. So this kind of determines whether we go through with the process or we don't go through with the process. That's where this determination is made is right here at this axon hillock. So functionally, I can break down neurons as being uh, functionally as to what they do. Um, so we have sensory neurons, we have motor neurons, uh, and then we have what we call inner neurons or association neurons are what we have. S uh, sensory neurons, okay, this is a diagram. I love this diagram. This diagram is pretty sweet. Um, this diagram here is just showing you the different neurons that we have um, uh, functionally. This is a sensory neuron that's here. And the sensory neurons are going to become stimulated by some type of receptor. It's going to generate electrical impulse, okay, and it's going to travel towards the central nervous system. So sensory neurons communicate their information towards the CNS, okay? So sensory neurons communicate their information towards the central nervous system. Um, these are part of your senses. So like your, um, your back of your eye, it has sensory neurons. Your nose has sensory neurons. You have sensory neurons embedded within your skin, but they often have a receptor that's associated with them that's going to be a trigger for it to generate its electrical impulse. So when we take a look like in your eye, your eye has specific receptors that are associated with the sensory neuron, um, like rods and cones and things like that, um, that are going to cause this neuron, the sensory neuron to generate electrical impulse and then send it to the central nervous system. When we're in the central nervous system, we have another type of neuron that is called an association neuron. So this is an association neuron that's right here. And these association neurons serve as a connector between sensory neurons and motor neurons. Um, so these association neurons are going to be the ones that are going to be processing the information. So sensory neurons are predominantly, uh, the predominant neuron um, that is found within your brain is this sensory neuron. So sensory neurons are predominantly, are the predominant neuron um, that is found within your brain. And this is going to process that information, and then eventually when we process this information, we respond, and we respond via a motor neuron. And a motor neuron is going to receive this information from the association neuron and it's going to generate its electrical impulse and these motor neurons then are going to release their neurotransmitters into cardiac muscle okay they're going to release it into smooth muscle skeletal muscle or they're going to release a neurotransmitter into a gland so the uh, motor neurons are the ones that get the actual response 
um, they, re they, they fire into uh, the muscle to get that, re that response for it to contract um, or if it's a gland for it to release some type of product or something like that. So motor neurons are going to release neurotransmitters into cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, or skeletal muscle, or they also release it into glands. These association neurons that are right here are the ones that are processing the information. Um, we introduced you to a guy by the name of Franciscus Donder um, that gets us thinking about thinking, and he comes up with in the 1800s this amazing hypothesis that the more complex the event, um, the, uh, the longer that it takes. Uh, note he's doing this in the 1800s. Um, in, the 19, uh, in, in today's era, uh, what we realize is that, you know, the more complex the task, the more synapses that are involved, the more neurons that are involved, so the longer that it's going to take. Um, now, when you become more efficient and we become better at something, okay, the less thinking that's involved, the less of these association neuron synapses that you have, and you can do something a lot quicker, um, which is where we get that term that's called, you know, the old ball coach always says, hey, practice. If you practice, it makes perfect. Keep working at it. Um, you'll get better. You'll become quicker at it. Um, neurologically speaking, that's true um, when we take a look at that. And, and in class, we did a variety of labs and things like that. Um, that tested out uh, this, uh, this particular uh, hypothesis that, uh, that Donder came up with. So just to recap, we have our sensory neurons. Okay, um, Sensory neurons carry impulses uh, from the sensory receptors. Remember, sensory neurons have receptors that stimulate them um, to the central nervous system. Um, and then the motor neurons carry it away. The connection between the sensory neurons and the motor neurons are the inner neurons, and these are the ones that are found in the central nervous system predominantly that are processing this information that they're receiving from the, from the, from the, sensory, uh, from the sensory neurons, um, how they're going to respond. Um, so you can kind of think of this, uh, like for instance, like if I'm going to kill a bug or something like that. So I see the cockroach, light from the cockroach goes into my eye. Um, I'm able to process the, the sight of that cockroach in my occipital lobe. That's where I process that vision-wise. And then I have to think about it, okay, with these association neurons. Okay, what are things I want to do with this cockroach, with these association neurons? Okay, I want to stomp on the cockroach. Um, so I'm going to respond via a motor neuron that's going to lead to my leg, and then I'm going to, uh, to squash that bug. So that's kind of how that thought process works between all of them. You have your sensory neuron, you have your inner neurons, and then you respond via a motor neuron that goes to a given location. The sensory neurons, like I said, have this particular... Uh, receptors that are associated with them. Now, if that wasn't enough, um, I can break down these neurons not only functionally, but I can break them down structurally as to what they look like. Um, and all of your motor neurons and all of your inner neurons are what we call multipolar neurons. And multipolar neurons, they have they have a variety of processes that are coming off of the cell body. Let me get this to go right here. So a multipolar neuron has a variety of processes that are coming off of the cell body. So you can see here, if I take a look here, you can see that this is a, uh, this is a, a multipolar neuron. This is the cell body that's right here, and you can see it has a lot of processes that are coming off of it. So it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It has a ton of processes that are coming off of it. That's why this is what we refer to as a multipolar neuron. Like I said, all of your motor neurons and then all of your inner neurons are what we call multipolar. Now, uh, your sensory neurons fall into one or two categories um, as far as structure are concerned. We have one that's called a bipolar neuron. So this is a bipolar neuron that's here. And you can see with this bipolar neuron, here's the cell body. There's an appendage here. That's one appendage. This is the second appendage. It's right here. So this is the first one. This is the second one. Note, one of these is the dendrit dendritic end. And then the other one is the axon end that we have. This is what we call bipolar neuron. Um, this type of neuron is really rare in your body. Um, it's found within your nose and in your eyes where we find it. Um, the bulk of the neurons that we find uh, that are sensory based in your uh, body of a human, um, the bulk of them are what we call unipolar neurons. Um, this is a diagram of a unipolar neuron. And you can see with this unipolar neuron right here, this is the cell body, okay, and it has one process that's coming off of it. 
it still has a dendritic end that's here and then this goes in uniform once we cross the cell body right here then this becomes the axon um, I'm sorry up here is the dendritic end that's right here okay and then this whole structure right here is going to be the axon that we have and that's a uh, what we call a unipolar uh, neuron and the bulk of your sensory neurons look like that okay the bulk of your uh, the bulk of your sensory neurons are going to look like uh, this unipolar neuron that is here so I hope that helps out um, that just introduced you to the neuroglial cells and introduce you to the neurons the different types of neurons that we have both structurally and functionally so that's 20 minutes 20 minutes of your time uh, hopefully uh, hopefully you, you learned something and hopefully that helped uh, prepare you for the upcoming uh, test that you guys have.